Welcome to the Grace Story Podcast, where inspiring stories are brought to life. This podcast is made possible by Grace College and Seminary, located on the shores of Winona Lake in the great state of Indiana. I'm your host, Dr. Drew Flam. This is the Grace Story Podcast. Today, our guest on the podcast is Dr. Matt Harmon. Dr. Harmon is professor of New Testament studies at Grace. He received his PhD from Wheaton College and MDiv from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Matt is a prolific writer, having written many books, articles, and commentaries. Matt and his wife Kate are also known for being wonderful mentors to many and have often had students even living with them and their two boys, John and Jake. He's also an avid Ohio State Buckeye fan, for which he will be held accountable to God someday. <laughs> Dr. Harmon, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Drew. It's good I, to be here. I had to work in that, I, you know, Buckeye I dig. It. Hey, even, life is good as a Buckeye fan these days. It's so. in your biography. It about, is. Well, you know, you know, you know so it is. it is. Yeah, it is good to be a Buckeye. It is. It is, especially for football. Is it going to be the same for basketball? Uh, not quite to that level, but I okay. think they'll have a good year. Though I, they should be in the top three or four of the Big Ten. So. That's that, a good year for Ohio State basketball. That is a good year for Ohio State basketball. Life going all right for you these days? It is. So I'm currently on sabbatical, which is a little slower pace of life than the normal sort of teaching schedule for a, for a semester. So um, it's nice to have more time to focus on some writing projects and um, just not have your attention diverted and split across not just teaching, but also administrative responsibilities and such at, uh, at Grace here. So I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for the generosity of our administration in giving me a one-semester sabbatical to focus on some of these writing projects. Yeah, I got to figure that one out. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> yet, but, but you've got um, how many in the queue right now? Three? Uh, at least? At least, yeah. <laughs> yeah, two, two for sure will come out next year, and okay. then... Uh, a third one should probably come out, I would think, in early 2021. How um, your writing process, how long does it typically take for you from conception to completion for a book to be written? Yeah, that really varies by the nature of the project. So um, my commentaries tend to take a lot longer. Um, my Philippians commentary took me about five years to write. And the Galatians commentary that I'm finishing up has also been about a five-year project. Wow. The Some of the other books tend to be closer to, I would say, probably a two-year process from start to finish, from meaning from start to when I start writing it to when it's actually out and available for purchase, which then includes, of course, the editorial process on the publisher's end and such. What? Uh, how, how do you decide? Because you've written books across various spectrums. Mm -hmm. Um, how do you decide? Do the projects come to you? Do you sort of pursue the projects you're most interested in? Is it a combination thereof? How does that work? Yeah, it's really a combination of both. Um, I think that, uh, for example, my book, Asking the Right Questions, uh, was something that was uh, on my heart. I had, uh, had a, a real burden for uh, the topic of the book of helping people how to uh, help understand and apply the Bible to their lives. Uh, other opportunities uh, are brought to me, such as uh, the commentaries uh, are typically the publisher approaches me and says, we'd like you to write a commentary. Sometimes they'll even give me options as to, you know, these books are available. Is there anyone in particular you'd like to Because it'll be like on? in a series Correct. and there's other authors contributing. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, um, it's really just a combination of both, and also some of the books that I've written on topics have been uh, pitched to me by a publisher, or even uh, the book that I wrote called Making All Things New that I wrote with a friend of mine, Ben Glad. He approached me with the idea and said, hey, I think we could write this book together, and that would be something that would be helpful. So it really is a, a combination of both. So asking the right questions was one you sought out to write. Yeah. Um and what was your what was your motivation behind like what were you seeing mm -hmm. that made you said okay this book needs to be written sure well i think it was a combination of my experience uh in the local church as well as in the classroom where i sensed a genuine desire among believers to understand and apply the bible but along with that a pretty common frustration or at least an uncertainty of 
I'm not sure how to do that or where to start. And so I just became more and more burdened to think about how can I give a helpful starting point for anybody, not just a uh, a student at Grace College who's maybe one of our Bible majors who's going to go on and do, you know, deep dive study into Scripture. But what about the ordinary person sitting in the chairs on a Sunday morning who maybe isn't even a big reader, who's not going to pick up a 300-page book, but might pick up a book that's 120 pages that is very simply written and straightforward to help them understand the main point of the Bible and how to use a series of questions to understand that and then apply it to their everyday life. So let's uh, let's work that out from like beginning to end. So I, you know, I'm a, I am by no means a theologian, um, <laughs> no seminary training whatsoever, mm-hmm. but certainly value and think it's important to study the Bible. Just finished your Jeremiah study not that long ago that you uh, wrote. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like I open the Bible, where, what, do, what do I do when I get to the yeah, passage? Exactly. And I think that that very experience you're describing is so common that there can be this sense of, okay, I've opened my Bible and maybe I've even read a paragraph, I've read a chapter, now what? What, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. And so uh, I simply came up with a set of four questions that I think help you understand any passage. And those four questions are based on what Jesus says in Matthew 22 when he's asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he essentially says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And he says, and the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So to me, what Jesus is saying is that every passage in the Bible in some way is oriented to help us love God and or love others. So with that sort of framework in mind, the four questions to help you understand any passage are, are, are drawn from that, passage, mm. uh, from that passage. And so those four questions are simply, what do we learn about God? What do we learn about people? What do we learn about relating to God? And then what do we learn about relating to people? Oh, that's good. So just very simple. And these are questions that even a young child can really start to learn to ask. You don't need to have some sort of advanced degree to ask these kind of questions. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the heart behind it was, I want to make this as accessible as possible so that even parents, as they're working with young children, as they're modeling reading a passage of Scripture together, you can begin to model some of those questions of, Okay, so let's see what do we see what do we learn about God in this passage and begin to to help even from a young age kids have this understanding of the Bible is first and foremost about God, hmm. but it is also about us, and so we need to be looking for those realities as we read the passage. Oh, that's good. It's it is um tempting and this isn't necessarily bad, but it's tempting to open the Bible app and, you know, find a plan and mm-hmm. and work through a plan that maybe just is hopping you all over scripture because it's very topical in nature. And those aren't yes. bad things. Yeah. Um, but it, this takes you to the next step of at least a, more of a deep dive of how could mm-hmm. I work through a whole book yes. of the Bible or a whole section of scripture rather than just picking off a verse here or there, which can be dangerous for us. Correct. And I also think that it it helps you know how to handle even some of the more challenging books in the Bible, right? So I just got done with Daniel. Oh my goodness. I still have no clue <laughs> what I just read. There's a lot going on in Daniel. <laughs> but you know, as you as you're reading through scripture, like especially if you're maybe starting in Genesis, yeah. right? And you're you're reading through and there's a lot of great stories in Genesis and so it's very interesting. And then you get into Exodus and there's that there's the dramatic uh, redemption from Egypt. And then you get to Exodus 19 and they arrive at Mount Sinai and then God starts to give the law. And you start to think, (laughs) what do I do with this? And then there's long sections where it's chapter after chapter of laws that are pertaining to situations that are just so foreign to our current culture that you don't even know what to do with, right? Yeah. And I think that even if you stop and say, okay, I don't need to try to understand all the details of this, but if I stop and say, what am I learning about God? What does he value by giving these kinds of laws to his people? Mm. What kind of people does he want us to be as his people? 
So what are these laws telling us about the kind of people that he wants to be, wants us to be? So even then, you don't have to worry about, well, I don't know how to put together all of these mm. different rules and regulations, but you can still ask those questions of, well, what am I learning about God here? What am I learning about human beings and, and how I should relate to God and to, to my fellow, per, fellow human beings? When, when you have that framework, even some of the more challenging sections of Scripture can still be deeply beneficial to us even if we don't understand all the particular details and, and how it all fits together. Yeah, I love those four questions, even as uh, as a dad, you know, I mm-hmm. sometimes feel so insufficient to be able to teach my kids about the Word of God. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can, I can open a passage and read it and ask four questions. Yeah, absolutely. And together work through understanding how those four questions are answered in yeah. whatever passage of Scripture we find ourselves. Correct, absolutely. And that's also uh, an impressive ability for you to be able to um, not only deep dive in on some commentary work that is, you know, the tough slugging of Mm -hmm. working through the nuances of Scripture, but then to kind of pull up and uh, and allow um, us common folk like me uh, (laughs) uh, opportunities to Mm -hmm. learn how to read Scripture as well. So thank you for that. I've I've enjoyed that book myself, and I think it's been a a wonderful addition to your um, library of how many books have you written now? You know, are you at the point of losing count? <laughs> Somewhere between seven and ten. Okay, I think I, I, think. I, I lose count <laughs> because there's it, always the next one. There, right? there yeah. is. I'm so focused on what I'm working on. You know, at this point, yeah. that by the time you finish a book and then it goes through the editorial process of the publisher and then they have all the marketing and by the time it actually gets out. That's typically anywhere from six to nine months. You're already on to the next I'm thing, I'm well right? on to the next thing by by that point. So um, it, it can be it can be uh, challenging to remember sometimes, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. That that one just came out now, and um, especially as I get asked questions about it, it's probably helpful for me to <laughs> try to look back and uh, remember what I wrote. Was that one of you, when you decided to go down this path of um, theological education, mm-hmm. was writing... Um, one of your main purposes, um, because it's something you've spent quite a bit of time doing. Yeah, I think it really was. Uh, from an from an early point in the whole process of, that God used to bring me to uh, see where he was leading me, uh, people had identified along the way the uh, some of the giftings that, that play into this, um, and that, 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 that helped contribute to my own growing sense of it seems like the Lord is leading in this direction. These are things that I want to do, and people seem to be confirming mm. that I have gifting and uh, abilities in this area, that they are uh, seeing fruit being produced through these efforts. And so um, I think that God used all that combination of things, and then he opened doors of opportunity for me to be able to uh, begin to write and connections with publishers and other scholars and uh, that definitely helped to bring me into a position where I could use these opportunities to try to be a blessing to those outside of my immediate circle mm-hmm. in the local church here at Grace as a professor to uh, an even broader audience. Gotcha. Um, one, do you remember what the first book was? Can Can you remember that one? Sure. Well, I, really, technically, that's the dissertation. So oh, that's okay. Okay, <laughs> which. That counts. I mean, I right? wrote one of those, but th- nobody wants to publish it. So, sure. you know, there's... <laughs> sure. Yeah. That, yeah. So that was really the first one. But then beyond that, um, the the first book, sort of solo book, I had yeah. written articles and some other things, was the Philippians commentary. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to take us on a right turn. Yeah. And um, we are approaching the Christmas season. Mm-hmm. And uh, we thought it'd be fun to have a conversation with the professor of New Testament <laughs> sure. um, at Grace College, sort of about Christmas, because we, we all bring a lot of background, history, knowledge, our own family experience sure. to, to the season mm-hmm. of Christmas. And I think it's helpful maybe for us to know, like, what should we be thinking about? What should we be believing? What should we be focusing on in this season? So I um, want to pick your brain a little bit about the story of Jesus' birth. Um, so first, just want to ask, you know, December 25th, like, 
why do we, <laughs> you know, celebrate Christmas sure. on December 25th? Yes. Well, I think it's important to start by saying we have no real evidence that Jesus was actually born on December 25th. Okay. The earliest um, evidence we have of even December 25th being used as a date to celebrate the birth of Jesus comes from the early 4th century. So we're talking several hundred years removed from the actual birth of Jesus. Okay. And even the choice of December 25th has its own interesting sort of background because there was already a pre-existing Roman holiday called Saturnalia, which was celebrating the Roman god Saturn Hmm. on that date, around that time. So as an attempt to sort of overtake the the sort of calendar of the Roman Empire, as as more and more Christian influence spread throughout the empire, Hmm. they replaced the celebration of this Saturnalia, which was on December 25th, and instead chose to mark the birth of Jesus on this date. Now, it is interesting that in the eastern parts of the Roman Empire, there was uh, a disagreement such that the eastern parts of the church actually celebrated Jesus' birth on January 6th. Oh, wow. So it even shows that within the early church, there was not this, like, definitive, clear um, consensus on December 25th has to be the day to celebrate it. Okay. Um, Is it still good for us to do so? Sure. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I don't think there's any, uh, any problem with that. I think that... One of the things that people might find surprising is that the the Bible itself seems very uninterested in giving precise, exact dates to a lot of events that we would love to know what was the exact date. Huh. And that applies to both the um, the birth of Jesus and even to some degree to his death, though we can date that far more precisely just because we know it happened during a Passover festival. But when it comes to the birth of Jesus, there's really not a clear answer to that. Some of the best scholarship I've seen lately suggests that Jesus was probably born around mid-October in the year 6 BC. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's based on uh, a combination of historical information as well as astronomical data from the time that tries to account for the Magi seeing this star that appeared to move in the in the heavens and trying to explain uh, what that might have actually been based on astronomical data from the time wow. and put that together with when Jesus might have been born. Well, you even brought up sort of the B.C.A.D. thing, mm-hmm. yes, which um, at least to me sort of somehow centers around Jesus. Absolutely. Because um, he's born when that whole thing changes. Right. How, like how did, I mean, how did that whole calendar even get concepted based off sure. of the Jesus life, birth. Yeah, so it really didn't originate until the 6th century. Okay, so we didn't celebrate Christmas till the 4th century, and then it's even a couple hundred years later we're talking about the calendar. Correct. Interesting. Correct. So there was an effort by a a, a monk and mathematician, which is an interesting combination of, uh, of, of vocations there, that, um, that wanted to try to recognize the pivotal decisive nature of the birth of Jesus as starting this new period of human history. Hmm. So that was definitely the motivation behind trying to date when Jesus was actually born. The problem is this Roman monk uh, miscalculated. (laughs) (laughs) And so that's why uh, instead of, you know, it sort of hitting that hinge point, it's off by about four to six years when okay. it comes to Jesus was probably born. Uh, we know he could not have been born any later than 4 BC because that's when Herod the Great died. And he's the Herod from the biblical account who the wise men approached and asked about the birth of the newborn mm-hmm. king and also the one responsible for the massacre of the uh, infants and young children in Bethlehem. So we know he died in 4 BC. So that's like the latest that hmm. we can say we know Jesus had to have been born before that. So we know that this monk did not get his math degree at Grace College. Correct. Is what we're, Correct. We Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. What are um, <laughs> what are some other you know general myths that are out there around Christmas time? Mm-hmm. Um, 
that you can debunk for us? <laughs> well, I think that um, some of uh, many of them accumulate around these wise men or these magi yeah. that uh, are talked about in Matthew chapter two. One one simple illustration of that is um, the biblical text doesn't say there were three of them. But in all of our sort of nativity stories yep, and the yep. crash scenes and all those sorts of things, there's always three. And that's probably in part based on the fact that there are three gifts specified that they bring with them. And so that probably led to the uh, each one of them bearing one different kind of gift. Mm -hmm. And related to that is the fact that our crash scenes often give this impression that the Magi were there the night Jesus was born. So you have the baby Jesus in his in, in his uh, in the in the manger there. You've got Joseph and Mary. You've got the shepherds who have been you know called in by the angelic announcement, and then you've got these wise men there as well. But when you read a little bit more closely, both Matthew and uh, even Luke, it becomes apparent that these wise men probably did not show up to uh, where Joseph and Mary were with with the baby Jesus for at least several months, maybe even up to a year hmm. after Jesus was actually born. So that, um, and that's not to downplay the significance of the visiting or anything, but it's also just one of those little minor things where um, it's not uh, it's not exactly accurate to, yeah. to sort of picture all of them together in this uh, in this stable. So in the Harmon household, do you like put the Magi like off by a couple <laughs> feet just to represent it correctly, or you know, do you still allow them in the same scene? Well, I've tried, <laughs> and um, let's just say there are others in the Harmon household who um, just like to say, "Okay, can we just for a moment get past the historical details <laughs> and bring them together?" And so I don't, I don't, I don't force the issue. Decide which battles to fight. <laughs> exactly. So. Are there any other sort of myths or stories that have grown in significance over the years that, you know, we as Christians should maybe think a little bit more deeply about? Yeah, well, I don't know how how significant, uh, significant this one is, but, um, you know, there's the classic line in one of the Christmas songs about uh, no crying he makes that the baby Jesus wasn't crying. Right, and right. and uh, uh, I just say that's just... I want to be I want to be gracious, but that's just wrong. <laughs> uh, G the baby Jesus was fully human, and yeah. so uh, there is no doubt in my mind that he uh, that he cried, that he fussed in the sense of you know that's that's how babies indicate I need to be changed or I'm hungry or those kinds of things. Right, so right. Um, the, the the thought that that somehow there was this sort of idyllic picture of. Jesus was this um, this baby who never cried mm -hmm. or never made any noise. Uh, doesn't quite line up, I think, with what reality would have been. Do you uh, find um, Christians at all emphasizing wrong, not wrong, but um, less significant aspects of the story? I mean, what, what when we think of Christmas, um, what should we as Christians? most focus our hearts and minds on. Sure. Well, I think that even as you read um, Luke 2, the story of Jesus' birth, one of the things that it keeps coming back to is this idea of Mary treasured these things in her heart. So she's observing all of these things. She's thinking back to how the angel Gabriel announced to her originally that she was going to bring into this world the Christ child. And all of these amazing things with the shepherds coming in and talking about the angelic announcement and all of these realities and her responses to, to treasure them as, in part, as really the fulfillment of God's promises. As, a, as an observant Jewish young woman, she would have been very familiar with the promises that God had made in the Old Testament. And she even shows that when she has her song of praise, when she talks with Elizabeth, her relative, that she clearly knows her Bible. Yeah. And she knows that what God is doing is the fulfillment of his promises to his people to bring redemption. And I think that it is easy in our current situation, our current culture, with the commercialization yeah. and the romanticizing of Christmas, to lose sight of that reality that at the heart of the biblical story is this child is the 
embodiment of the fulfillment of God's promises, and to remember that Christmas is about gifts in the sense of God has given us the greatest gift in his son, Jesus. What, um, so considering that, the commercialization part, and I know we as a family always struggle with, how do you both, um, you know, allow your kids to enjoy trees and presents sure. and lights and fun songs and all those kind of things, and yet make sure still that we as a family are, are focused on Jesus, the fulfillment of God's promises, the Savior of the world. Sure. You know, give us a peek into the Harmon household on December 25th, Jesus's <laughs> not real birthday, sure. um, and how you ensure that, you know, your family is enjoying the celebration, but also focused on the right things. Yeah. Well, I think that um, part of that answer is it has to start before December 25th. So I think one of the helpful tools can be an advent calendar. Mm. We, we've used those in our family. Uh, our boys are probably a little old for it now as they're both <laughs> college students here at Grace. But um, one of the benefits of that is having something each day to look forward to. There's a piece of candy in there, but also there would be a passage of Scripture that we would read that would either anticipate the birth of Jesus or uh, talk about something he would do or accomplish for his people. Mm. To build up this sense of anticipation each day as they're um, going through this Advent calendar. I also think that something that we found helpful was on Christmas Day, we would have a birthday cake hmm. for Jesus. Okay. As a sort of reminder that this is what this is really about, and to try to bring it into their world of, um, well, when it's your birthday, we have a cake, and we have a candle, and we celebrate, and, and, and so it's sort of to try to bring to their mind of this is, in, in one sense— just like that. Mm -hmm. It's the birth. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus. On Christmas morning, I mean, typically on Christmas Eve, we're, we go to church and, uh, and worship together as a family. And then Christmas morning, we always read uh, Luke 2 together before we do anything else in terms of opening gifts or anything like that and have a big meal, just as a, as a reminder of this is the reason that we're celebrating today and, and not to get all focused on, oh, I can't wait to see what's under the tree. Am yeah. I going to get that thing I really, really... Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. How many candles do you put on that birthday cake? I mean, <laughs> according to your calculations, we beat up to like 2,025-ish, right? Or something? Yeah. So I, to get past that, we just put one <laughs> to make it simple. And who gets to blow it out? You do it, both of them at the same time? You know, is... We mix it up. We mix it up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any any favorite Christmas songs, or let me also say, any Christmas songs that you're like, you know what, um, if if I could choose a couple that you maybe wouldn't sing, um, these would be on my <laughs> not sing list, and these would be on my favorites list. Sure, sure. Well, uh, I'm going to avoid being the Grinch, and I'm not <laughs> I'm not going to call out any specific Christmas songs that uh, that I don't care for, but uh, I tend to like the more traditional. Christmas hymns, so uh, ones like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Joy to the World. I, I especially appreciate how uh, there's, a, there's a part of the, the song Joy to the World that focuses on the birth of Jesus isn't just about my personal salvation, but it's about God ultimately making all things right in the mm -hmm. world and renewing creation, that that's a, a, a part of the Christmas story in one sense. And so... Uh, those are some that, that I uh, have always enjoyed. There are uh, two Christmas albums in the Harmon household that I especially enjoy that are, that are more contemporary music, so it's not um, just redoing cl Christmas classics. Yeah. Uh, one of them is by Andrew Peterson called Behold the Lamb of God. It's amazing. Just heard him in concert this weekend. He is great. Yes. And... Um, He's got just a good mixture of of music on there. There's a there's this really fascinating song on there. It's called Matthew's Begats. I don't know if you've ever heard this album before. I don't know if I have. But he actually sings the genealogy 
in Matthew. Huh. And it's really clever. It's really catchy and 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 and, and engaging. And so uh, you don't tend to think of genealogies as something you're like, ooh, that'd make a good Christmas song. <laughs> but he he pulls it off. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of good biblical theology on there of telling the story of preparing for Jesus and then what he will accomplish. So that's one of our favorites in the Harmon household. The other is uh, by Sovereign Grace Music called Prepare Him Room, which has uh, several good uh, modern Christmas songs that focus our attention on uh, on the work of Jesus and preparing uh, to, to worship in light of that. Hmm. Mariah Carey's album didn't make the list. It for... didn't. In fact, huh. there's um, my wife really enjoys the Celine Dion Christmas <laughs> oh. album, and so uh, that was actually probably the album that led to me banning Christmas music <laughs> outside of the Thanksgiving to New Year's <laughs> Day window. I just I, it got to be too much. <laughs> uh, I, I've I've tried and failed because I think uh, my kids have all sided with my wife on the yeah, let's do Christmas. You're outnumbered there. In fact, my kids. Um, um, there was a Christmas sale at a re- at a church um, nearby, and my youngest, who's four, got really excited about this, and literally spent all of his spend money um, to buy himself a Christmas tree. This was like three weeks ago. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so e- each of our boys already have decorated Christmas trees in their rooms with lights on them. Um, because they got so excited, and, and my wife was more than willing to jump on board with their <laughs> pre-excitement for yes. Christmas. Yes. So uh, I, um, you have a stronger will than I do, it sounds like. Well, um, but you're outnumbered. See, my, my, <laughs> my, my boys were not clamoring to start the Christmas music that early, so... Um. I, I had a fighting chance. In you. There you go. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate that you've brought up is um, we can get so myopically focused on Jesus' birth mm-hmm. and not see the grander story from Genesis to Revelation right. that is told by the Christmas story. Right. And that seems to be one of the things you're bringing up here is like, hey, let's let's remind ourselves of the promises. Right. And oh, hey, let's remind ourselves that, you know, joy to the world is not just something that is, hey, he came, but right. what's he going to do? And then what, it, what what's going to happen when he comes again? Sure. Um, that seems to be thematic for you to yes. say, hey, let's take, let's look at the big picture. Right. And I think that it is helpful even as you're celebrating Christmas to have Easter in mind hmm. because he was born to die yeah. for our sins. He was born to live that life of perfect obedience, to die for our sins, and to rise to new life. And so Christmas is, in one sense, the the beginning of that new chapter, but it's not the last Word. In fact, it's only the beginning of what Jesus intends to do. And so I think that having in mind that whole specter, and, and even when you read Luke 2, one of the interesting things that happens is once you get past the birth of Jesus, when Mary and Joseph bring the baby Jesus into the temple, hmm. and they encounter this man named Simeon, whom uh, God had told him, you're not going to die until you see the Lord's Messiah. And when they enter the temple courts, the Holy Spirit taps Simon on the uh, Simeon, sorry, on the on the on the shoulder, and he says, "That's the one." And so he takes the Christ child in his arms, and he uh, proclaims, basically, "Here is the one sent to be a light of revelation for the Gentiles." And that's great. And then he turns to Mary, and he basically says, "This will ultimately lead to sorrow for you. A sword will pierce your." soul, Hmm. foreshadowing that he's born to die and that his mother is going to watch him die the most brutal kind of death the Roman Empire could offer as a criminal and a shameful way, so that even within the sort of larger Christmas story in Luke 2, Luke drops this little hint along the way of he's born to die, Hmm. and it's going to be sorrow at first but that that death is going to be the means by which, the sort of paradoxical means by which he's going to bring life to the world. Wow. Uh, that is a great place to wrap up the conversation because that's uh, that's what it's all about. Yes. Um, and I appreciate you have a unique ability to 
um, have a mind for the details, but then an ability to raise all of our eyes higher and explain the truth of the gospel in a, in a way that I can understand. Um, and I so appreciate about that, that about you and your writings, Dr. Herman. Well, thanks for listening to the Gray Story podcast. Our music was written and produced by Dr. Wally Brath, Assistant Professor of Worship Arts at Grace College. And thanks to our co-producers, Andrew Palladino and Rick Neer. And as always, if you could do a huge favor and rate or comment wherever you retrieve the podcast from, we'd be so grateful. Until next time, live your best Grace Story today. <laughs>